Hi everyone, um, my name is Stephen Freda and um, I'm speaking to you from Australia where it is um, 5.25 in the morning. So I don't, uh, I apologise if I'm not wearing a suit, but uh, one doesn't wear that at 5.25 in Australia. Um, thank you so much for inviting me, Brian and everybody at NASA. This is a fantastic conference. I only wish that I could have seen more of the session, but it wasn't happening. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, uh, historical lessons from international law. So we just had a fantastic presentation from EJ looking at the historical evolution of West domestic law. I'm going to look at it from a different perspective, international law. And but but uh, as is apropos for a historical um, conference, let me start off by saying, and this is relevant to space, that the land on which uh, I am speaking to here in Australia, um, people have been living here for 65,000 years. So there is history. Um, 65,000 years, two and a half thousand generations of people. And uh, our indigenous people and indigenous people around the world have had incredible perspectives on space. Uh, and there's a lot of knowledge, there's a lot of magic, there's a lot of culture about space that is so important for us today, and I'll come back to that in my talk, and is of course relevant for ongoing work as we move into an even greater commercial space world in space. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. I'm just click go uh, through to one more. Thank you. So what I want to do is give you some historical context about space and how that reflects on international law and then in with uh, some ideas about uh, uh, how, uh, how uh, I can just hear that people can't hear me. Um, I'll, I'll speak, if I take this off, is that better everybody? If I speak directly into the microphone, is that better? That is better, thank you. Oh, my sincere apologies everybody. Um, I'm just trying not to wake up the people uh, upstairs who are still sleeping. Um, what I want to give you is just the historical context of space and how that reflects the law. So clearly space, as we all know, is a geopolitical arena. Um, the international law that we have following Sputnik was by and large developed in a Cold War context. The technology was by and large developed with military eyes. and PJ referred to ITAR, ITAR and equivalents in other countries are a reflection of the idea that still many people look at space and space technology as weapons technology, as missile technology, as military technology. And this, the way we regulate space has been bifurcated in the past. We've had two UN bodies looking at it, one looking at quote unquote peaceful aspects of it and the other looking at the security and weapons aspect of it. But that was based on, a, on an expectation and assumption that you could have peaceful activities in space and you can have military activities in space and never the twain shall meet. Well, we all know that increasingly so, that is not the reality. The reality is that space is a dual use domain. So you have an incredible commercial sector, as everybody is aware, but the customers of that commercial sector are often the military. And so you have dual use satellites, that, which gives rise to very difficult questions of international law. But satellites operated by commercial entities, part of the payload, part of the transponder capacity is commercial, civil activities, and another part is um, military activity. So you can see that blurs. Um, next slide. Space, uh, and down to the end, one more. One more click, please. Thank you. So, we're talking about commercial space. Originally, of course, space in the really early days of law was uh, anticipated to be an activity by countries, but already in the main treaties, in Article 6 of what we call the Outer Space Treaty, um, after uh, negotiation between the Soviet Union and the United States as to what that would say, 
it allowed for the possibility that non-governmental space. So if you fast forward to, well, I've got 2020, you can see I'm still in yesterday's world. So if you fast forward to today, there are many actors in states. States are, of course, still incredibly important. But the commercial sector is incredibly important. And you'll see some numbers down on the bottom there. And depending upon which investment bank you believe, this, these numbers could ratchet up to one trillion or even three trillion dollars worth of commercial space in the not too distant future. And so the international law which governs countries doesn't govern the commercial sector, hence the rise of national space law, hence the rise, as TPA described, what's happening in the United States, but also elsewhere in the world. And I've had the privilege of working with about nine or ten countries to help them develop and also reform the national space. Uh, next slide. We must remember space is also many other things. And uh, if you've heard me talk in other contexts, I'm always talking about making sure we hear all of the voices of space. And uh, because space is historically, at present, and into the future linked to human activity, human rights, human development, and in fact, the future of humanity. So all of those other voices, as well as the commercial and political um, are important as well and there, a lot of them arise from the historic nature of space and the history of space activities. Next slide. Thank you. I won't bore you with too much law but um, most of you would be aware but just to make sure that um, we're all on the same page from a legal perspective and, and PJ hinted on this when he was talking about jurisdictional issues Space is an area beyond national jurisdiction. So um, American law applies to airspace above America. American law does not apply to the outer space above America. It will apply to the satellites personnel. Yes, of course, just like American law will apply to the uh, a US flag shipped in the high seas and everybody on board. That. But the way we characterize space at international law, and this then is reflected in how we have to develop national law, is it's an area beyond national jurisdiction governed by international law. Next slide. Um, down to the bottom one. Thank you. Um, I should mention uh, just from the last slide that uh, the obvious question, of course, based on the fact that American law applies to the airspace but not the outer space, is where is that delimitation? And um, that's the first question that every student in space law asks in the first class. I know PJ and Diane have had that question many times as well. The answer is we don't know the answer. For a whole range of historical and political reasons, international law has not yet agreed a demarcation between airspace, national law, and outer space, international law. And you would have thought that would cause problems. Really, nothing has turned on that as yet. But as we continue to develop more and more commercial activities, the commercial sector, and remember PJ was talking about the need for certainty and clarity, this is one issue amongst a whole range of issues that the commercial sector may wish to have clarified. But there are geopolitical reasons why we don't have yet this agreed frontier. So if I can give you anything to go away with, it's the first bullet point. Um, space is not the wild, wild west. Space is not an area where you can do anything you want. There is a lot of law. There have been phases of international space law making. Um, again, in the interest of time, I won't go through it all. But immediately from Sputnik, um, and I was born in 1957, so I call myself Sputnik baby. Um, immediately after Sputnik, there were discussions about all of these legal issues and many more have developed since. Ultimately, through the United Nations, we have five treaties. They're up, in, uh, they're up on the screen there. Um, for geopolitical reasons, again, after that fifth of those agreements, the Moon Agreement, which talked about an issue that is, of course, very relevant today, how do we go about exploiting space resources? For a whole lot of political reasons, there were fissures of viewpoints between various countries at that time 
at exactly the same time there were the same fissures about exploiting the deep seabed under the high seas and so as a result we haven't had any further space treaties because of the disagreements that arose but law has continued next slide please and we've had next slide thank you um we've had uh since the 1980s a lot of uh, people call it soft law although it's not an expression i like a lot of guidelines you heard about the debris mitigation guidelines and long-term sustainability guidelines along with general assembly principles and of course as more and more commercial actors are involved we have as pj says 30 to 40 countries with national law and i'm currently working with four or five more to develop new laws so that number is continuing to grow and that is there to regulate the private sector the commercial sector this burgeoning huge commercial area of space um states need to take responsibility through an authorization process through a supervision process and a whole range of other areas to at the same time be good international citizens and comply with their international obligations but also to encourage commerce entrepreneurship industry certainly etc as is appropriate to the particular country next slide uh, down to the end. Thank you. Um, of course, other areas besides the, the specific space law will be relevant when we look at um, space, but it's not a copy-paste exercise. Space is a unique environment, as is the high seas, as is Antarctica, as is the Arctic, etc. So we can't just say, well, if there is an uncertainty in the existing international law, we'll just pick something from other parts of international law and apply it there. It doesn't quite work that way. But having said that, there are lessons and analogies that we can learn from other areas of international law. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, thank you. So this is my second last slide, guys. So I hope I'm still on uh, time. Um, really, this, this is about history in the past and future challenges and lessons learned from that history and how are we going to move forward in the continuing development of, of international space law and remember international space law then informs national law that said of course the greater amount of national law and national initiatives you know other things like let's say the Artemis Accords and other things as well they will also inform the development of international law. So it's a two-way street. But focusing on international space law, there are real challenges. And the challenge in terms of how we go forward, because, of course, many of the fundamental principles, they apply really well, continue to apply, will apply in the future. However, of course, uh, those principles were not put in place with an expectation that we'd be doing many of the activities we're doing now because of the development of technology. Yet they'll apply. So those principles apply, but it's important that we augment them with various types of uh, additional forms of regulation, be they binding or guidelines or whatever, it depends on what we can agree. Technology is the challenge. Technology in a dual use <coughs> uh, scenario is a challenge for law. How do we address those challenges? Well, of course, it's tempting that as something comes up, and this is a similar theme to what PJ said in terms of reactive, as something comes up, it's tempting to quick, let's solve that problem. Let's apply a band-aid here. But because of the complexities of space, because if you attempt to do something over here with this activity that will have an impact on activities here so if we do something for example about regulating small satellite constellations that will have impacts on debris that will have impacts on orbit that will have impacts on spectra and a whole range of other issues and so as we move forward and obviously i'm talking about the ideal nothing's all ever perfect we need to avoid the band-aid and look at this in a holistic way. So we need to get not just the lawyers and the diplomats and the decision makers in the room, but we need the engineers and the scientists and the economists and the military people 
and the cultural people and the historians, of course, all in the room to look at space in a holistic way. So what are the commercial, the, the challenges driven by technology? I've got a laundry list of some of the major challenges there about, of course, debris, about military uses, about large satellite uh, constellations, small satellite constellations, space traffic management. You've heard all of these things. My last bullet point there is not entirely space and therefore not within the purview, I assume, of things that NASA is looking, but you'll see that, um, and, and I've been involved in drafting this for, for example, New Zealand when they put their space law in place. My original brief was to help them draft their space law. But in the end, they said, well, as we're doing this, there's a lot of technology that's pseudo-satellites and drones and high-altitude platforms. Let's incorporate an authorization system into our legislation as well. And so the New Zealand law, for example, is called the Space and High Altitude Platform um, Activities Act. So there's an incorporation of both. And I think more and more countries, Australia is looking at it as well, are going to have to look more and more at the regulation of high altitude as well. That's a side issue, but it's an additional issue for all. My last slide. How are we going to put together these laws, uh, this augmenting, these augmenting uh, regulatory frameworks to cover the challenges posed by commercial space, which drives technology, which allows us to do more things, but raises many, many issues. So what are the lessons we can learn from that? Well, here are three overarching principles that I, as a non-historian, garner from space history. Firstly, notwithstanding, notwithstanding geopolitical tension on Earth, and of course space involves a lot of rivalry, a lot of competition, of course we hear a lot of issues about national security interests and, and other states compromising another state's uh, space activities and all of that. Of course, they are absolutely important and absolutely valid concerns, along with every other concern, as we develop a legal framework. But let me also say that notwithstanding all of those tensions, those that perhaps are, are not the best of friends geopolitically on Earth still have more in common in maintaining space in a sustainable and peaceful way than they have differences. And that is because of the, the, the nature of space. Space has always been a, a, you know, a mixture of rivalry and cooperation. Even during the Cold War, there was great cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union in various aspects. And you'll all be aware of the various missions of cooperation notwithstanding, of course, the geopolitical part. And space, we all have a common interest in space because, of course, every country is dependent on space. And the major space-faring nations, and of course, historically and still at present, the United States is still the major space power, although others are developing incredible capabilities. But the major space-faring nations, and there's many of them, um, are increasingly dependent on space. The commercial sector is com increasingly dependent on it. And if we were to engage in translating our mistrust and perhaps irresponsible behaviour on Earth, if we were to translate that into space and compromise others' uh, ability to, to utilise space, that will always also reverberate against us. Those that have the most to lose if we compromise space in some irreversible way, are indeed the major space training nations. There is this common interest to, of course, beat one's chest and try to get the best possible position and posture for oneself, but recognise that there are certain lines that cannot and must not be crossed because, in the end, that will ruin it for everyone. The second historical lesson is that space is about humanity. It's about many things, as I've said, but humanity is at the forefront. And as we move forward in law, if commercial space allows us, for example, to, do, to now do 500 things in space, perhaps at some point we need to work out, well, what are the 300 that we should prioritise? 
I know that's a silly example, but I, I hope the message gets through. Space is about humanity. Space, our, our future is in, enveloped in how we utilize space, use space, respect space, use space. If we think of it purely as something to exploit without being conscious of the damage that irreversible action might cause, then in fact, that's a real problem for, for the future of humanity and certainly for the development of uh, countries and their systems and their economies. And that filters down to basic human rights. And the third historical lesson is a lesson that we learn from it. We are stewards and custodians. Of course, on Earth, we've created many amazing things, but of course, on Earth, we've made many mistakes. And the notion as we move forward in the world, which is then, I mean, and the idea of international law is really to regulate responsible behavior, to encourage responsible Let's do that with a notion of stewardship. Now, of course, that might necessarily be on all fours with the hard-nosed bottom line commercial idea of maximizing profits, of course. But in the end, the commercial sector wants space to, to continue as a sustainable area so they can continue to develop their revenues through new activities. So again, it's in their interest, it's in all of our interests to regard planet, but also space, with eyes of stewardship and custodianship. And if I do the full circle, that's exactly the message we get from in Australia, but I'm sure around the world, our Indigenous people, that, that space is a place of wonder, it's a place of magic, and it's not ours in a sense to overrun, it's ours in a sense to use respectfully and if we do that there are many benefits for all of us but you know let's try to ensure that we recognize these important lessons from history as we move. thanks so much everybody I, I hope um that was helpful i apologize for the sound problems at the beginning and thank you again for the invitation over to you di thank you